Good morning. My name is Dorothy Larson, Larson and Associates CPAs, also, by the way, adjunct professor at uh, Concordia University. Just miscellaneous trivia about me, unimportant. Um, <laughs> this morning, we have a wonderful opportunity to hear from the Chancellor at UCI. And before I bring him up, presumably, Steve Rosansky is going to come up after he gets done moving chairs. Because he would like to... The, the President of the Chamber of Commerce of Newport Beach would like to introduce a few people. Steve Rosansky, President of the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you all for coming. We've got a great speaker for you today. Um, you know, we actually don't have a slot of, well, yeah, there's a dignitary sitting right there on the second row. Which, Rush Hill, our former mayor and city council member. We have Pierre Swan, he's with, uh, on the board of, are you the chairman of the board or just on the board? Just a director. Just a director of the Irvine Ranch Water District. Thanks to them, we just got a check for their renewal. I appreciate that. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, and our, our chairman of our board and the Harbor Commissioner, Joe Stapleton. He's camera shy back there. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dorothy. Uh, we've got a great program for you, and I'll have a few announcements at the end. Thank you. Why are you directly behind the camera? Best point of view. <laughs> well, I'm honored this morning to introduce Howard Gilman, Ph.D., the Chancellor at UCI. He's also a professor of political science, history, and law, and has written some what sound like honestly fascinating textbooks. One he thinks you'll be more interested in, um, The Votes That Counted, How the Court Decided the 2000 Presidential Election. That should be really interesting reading for most people. Also, the Constitution besieged, which sounds to me really interesting because it talks about the era when FDR and the folks in New York were trying to get more, essentially, civil rights, rights for workers, and the court was striking down, the Supreme Court was striking down a lot of the things that they tried to pass, and that's when you hear about FDR trying to pack the court because when he was trying to put forward the New Deal. Sorry for the lecture. Um, <laughs> but it was so interesting. And anyway, um, that's what that's about. And I recommend you read his version. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Gilman graduated with three degrees from UCLA and then taught at USC. And when I tried to get him to pick, um, one of his assistant chancellors in PR, or Kate Klimo, mentioned that really now it's all about UCI. So with that, I'd like to bring up Dr. Gilman. And Steve, from my point of view, everyone here is a dignitary, so I don't think that's a Yes. No, I'm not running for office. <laughs> Except in so far as when you're a chancellor, you're always running for, uh, for office. Uh, those of you in the back that are standing up, it's perfectly fine if you want to do it. I know it gets you a good way to get out of here if I start saying wrong uh, or boring things. But there are plenty of seats available. This is my professor being channeled again because students do the same thing. And so if, if you wanted to make yourself comfortable, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, you'll keep an eye on me and I'll, I'll keep an eye on you. Uh, but uh, tremendously excited for the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, it's very important when you have such a great mission uh, as great research universities have that you don't think that you're only talking to people within the campus. That we exist not for ourselves, we exist as institutions hopefully to serve society and to serve the region. And so I'm grateful for the chance just to allow you to be ambassadors on behalf of the University of California Irvine a little bit more by talking about one of my favorite topics and that's talking about uh, the campus. And I hope, uh, so what I'd like to do is spend uh, a little bit of time uh, talking about some updates, some recent facts and figures, some of our recent accomplishments. Uh, I can go on for a very long time, but I'll see if I can compress it in a way that is digestible and hit some highlights. 
And then I do want to say a few things in particular about one area of strategic focus that I think may be of special interest to people uh, who are associated with the Chamber of Commerce, and that is the area of commercialization and tech transfer. So I'm going to do a general update, and then we'll talk specifically about issues of really economic development for the region and the role, I hope, that UCI can help play with all of you in promoting um, more of an innovation uh, economy in Orange County. So, I think it's good for me to talk not just about economic development, but more generally about the campus to you all, because great research universities should be vitally important anchoring institutions for regions. And by anchoring institution, I don't just mean that we're one of the largest employers uh, in the county, although we are. Uh, we have about 22,000 full and part-time employees. Uh, second only to Disneyland. But instead, given the scope of our mission, given what we are here to do, to educate the brightest young people, to create the next generation of researchers and scholars and professionals, to explore the frontiers of knowledge, to be an engine of innovation, to fight disease, and to promote human well-being, and to understand and resolve the most serious challenges that are facing our world and our communities, given that that's our job, and what an amazing job that is to have, we have a unique role to play in Orange County with, I think, strengths of great value in terms of our talent, in terms of our focus, in terms of our mission, that are unlike any other institution in the region. And it, it is my belief that the ongoing development of Orange County is, or at least should be, inextricably tied to the ongoing development of its one great AAU research university. There are only 60 high-end elite research universities in the country that are part of this affiliated group known as the Association of American Universities, AAU. And one of the things that is true is that regions that have AAU research universities benefit in very distinctive ways in terms of the development of our human capital, in terms of the talent of the faculty that come, in terms of the partnerships that we're able to forge on lots of issues ranging from arts and culture to commercialization to the K-12 through mission uh, to sustainability and on and on and on. And so we have this abiding sense of what our responsibility is, given the breadth of that mission. And so as we move forward and develop the campus, our focus isn't just on developing our expertise and excellence for the sake of ourselves, you know, for the sake of recruiting more Nobel Prize winners or National Academy members. We need to develop the campus over the next five or ten years in a way that continues to have as strong an impact in the world, but especially in the region as possible. So I need you as leaders of the community who care about where Orange County is going over the next five or 10 years to realize that it is part of our ongoing ambition to make sure that we're working with you in partnership, finding ways in which we can play our appropriate role in the ongoing development and greatness of Orange County. So a couple of facts and figures to give a sense of the scope and breadth of our mission. Our annual budget is currently around $2.4 billion. Uh, so I'd like to say that we are a $2.4 billion innovation machine. Uh, I guess you could say that in one metaphor, I'm the CEO of a $2.4 billion company. But the difference between my company and your company is that my, I can't fire my employees. Uh, yeah, so, so try to run a company with employees who have tenure, right? Uh, and they think I work for them rather than the other way around, and, and that's, that's probably right. That's probably right. So we're a $2.4 billion operation, and our impact on the local economy is on the order of about $4.3 uh, billion. But because we are a leading research university, one of the ways in which we impact the region is that we bring in hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars from outside of the state and the region in order to have an impact within Orange County. So we do right now over $300 million a year in what we call research expenditures, right? So that when the faculty who are doing research are getting support for their research, right now it's over uh, $300 million a year. And that has a lot of impact in a lot of other areas, in many areas. But let me just give you one example 
of how that impacts the local uh, economy uh, and the well-being of the people, of our neighbors, in a way that you might not think. Because when you're thinking about research, you might think about all the molecules in the labs that people are manipulating. But consider this impact that we've had just in the last year for our local schools. So, one of our faculty members from the School of Education, Carol Booth Olson, received an $11.2 million grant from the U.S. Department of Education to expand and test innovative teacher development programs to increase literacy for English as second language students. She is going to create a program that will impact 300 teachers, four school districts, and about 100,000 students in our region. So, we have one faculty member, $11 million grant to specifically focus on our teachers and our students. A few months ago, Brad Hughes from our uh, Ayala School of Biological Sciences received a $6.4 million grant from the National Science Foundation to research how you could use the arts in order to promote better understanding of scientific concepts for young people who aren't understanding science in traditional ways in which you're thinking about it. And that's going to support teachers and students in eight of our local school districts. And recently, Stacy Nicholas donated $5 million to our Samueli School of Engineering because of the outstanding K-12 through outreach the engineering school has done to promote STEM education and STEM interest, especially among girls and underrepresented students in middle school and high school where you really need to develop that pipeline. So in the last year alone, UCI has galvanized more than $20 million of focused support into Orange County schools for the benefit of our teachers and students. And that kind of impact is sometimes missed when you think about research simply in terms of the sciences and when you think about our mission simply in terms of higher ed. But you know, we would be hard pressed to find an institution that year in and year out is focusing more expertise and attention and resources into ensuring that the sons and daughters of Orange County residents can thrive regardless of their background. And that if you move to Orange County, you know that there is a large collection of people around the state committed to making sure that all of our students can reach their highest potential. So that's one example of the kind of impact that we can have because we bring in these hundreds and hundreds of million dollars a year into the region, but still, Aside from K through 12, we are a premier institution of higher ed. So how are we doing with respect to that mission? Some facts and figures. This year, we had another record year for student applications. Only 89,000 students tried to get into UCI this year for our fall class. 89,000 applications. It puts us in the top 10 of all universities around the country. And of course, that means that we are even more selective uh, by, we're forced to be more selective uh, for the freshman class with about a 37% admit rate and of course higher SAT scores, higher GPAs. Uh, you know, we were talking before, Steve and I, about how we felt pretty good about ourselves when we were applying to college and really the, the quality of the students that come in now is just uh, extraordinary. Thank goodness we're not competing. Uh, uh, but even with that competition, the breadth of students that we bring in and the opportunities to create, that we create for students who otherwise really don't have opportunity to go to great institutions of higher education is really, I think, the, the great story. So not only a very competitive and elite group, but about half of all of our students are the first in their families ever to go to college. That number is really extraordinary. I mean, if I told you that you know, 15, 20% of our students were first generation college students, you'd probably think that that was pretty good. The fact that it's half is really quite extraordinary and reflects in part the changing demographics of California. This is really the future of California. Um, about 40% of our students actually come from low income families. And so it's easy to create elite world class institutions that serve very well elite, privileged families, right? Uh, any one of the University of California campuses, my campus serves more low-income students than all of the Ivy League combined. And so when you want to mix a world-class education with access 
for the sons and daughters of California really serve the democracy. There is no university system in the world that does a better job than the University of California, and so that's a great source of pride for us. Times Higher Ed has once again, just last week, ranked us the number one university in the country under 50 years old. That's for the fourth consecutive year. So we're celebrating our 50th anniversary, uh, and so we're now aging out of this ranking. Because uh, they don't do, you know, for the, you know, the number one university in the country 51 years or less, right? So, uh, but it's great to go out on top. And in terms of value propositions, Money Magazine ranks what they call value-added universities. So how much does it cost to go? And what is the economic impact that you have if you earn your degree from that institution? And on that value-added dimension, taking into account the demographics of our students, how students from their family backgrounds compared to students of other family backgrounds at other institutions were the number two university in the country as a value added. So world-class quality, outstanding value. Uh, so we're proud of that as well. And uh, we have tremendous institutions of higher ed within Orange County. I hope we partner with many of them, but I, I hope you'll allow us to brag a little bit that you know we think our student body is very special because it's a very competitive group and a very inspirational group. And we also have an extraordinary faculty. It's really hard to become a faculty member at one of the UC campuses. So we have 70 members of the National Academies and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. These are the most prestigious recognitions that you can get if you're a cutting edge faculty member making the most contributions, the highest level contribution to your fields. We have 120 fellows at the American Association of the Advancement of Science. You might not know exactly what that is, but it's got to sound a little impressive, right? Uh, and so, and those of you who are physics buffs may enjoy learning that eight of our faculty were involved with the research that discovered the Higgs boson. Oh, wow. And I will leave it up to you to explain to your friends in this room what exactly the Higgs boson is. Um, just in the last few months, we've seen stories of the work of our faculty making important contributions to understanding and resolving California's water crisis, understanding and addressing issues relating to epilepsy, severe flood risk in Newport Beach. We have a dedicated group of people helping map out those concerns so that we can do better planning for the future. Basic research on memory improvement, fuel cells, the melting of the glaciers in West Antarctica, stem cell treatments, Alzheimer's breakthroughs, as you can imagine, with thousands and thousands and thousands of world-class students and faculty. The list of contributions that we're making with our research mission is endless. But, of course, our impact is felt even beyond the work we do in education and basic research. So just ticking off a few things that you know, but again, I want to make sure that you can be good ambassadors for the institution. So our medical center has been ranked among the nation's best hospitals for the 14th consecutive year, is ranked as Orange County's top hospital, and is fourth best among Los Angeles area medical centers. We're also the county's only level one trauma center. And very importantly, we are the only National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center. Within the United States of America, there are 40 centers designated by the National Cancer Institute as those places where the most cutting edge research, exploration, and treatment occurs. And we're very proud to serve Orange County with that special designation. And as the region's only academic medical center, you know, we feel a special obligation to be here for the people of Orange County, especially when it comes to the treatment of serious cases. Part of our responsibility is to bring the future of medicine to you all today. Uh, some of you are lawyers, some of my best friends are lawyers, I have an appointment in the, the, our school of law, so what can we say about our school of law? I, I hope it sure looks like in a very, very short part of time, this community in the UCI Law School has just done an absolutely tremendous job. This last year, uh, the first year we were eligible to receive full accreditation from the American Bar Association, we received that full accreditation. This is, I think, by all measures, the finest launch of a premier law school that has ever been seen. Uh, we were ranked by US News in the first opportunity. We could be ranked in the top 30. Um, 
But actually, the quality of our faculty is in the top 10. If you're to look at law faculty, how they publish, and what impact they have, what other faculty are citing law faculty, how many people are reading and referring to them, we're actually the seventh ranked faculty in terms of impact in the legal academy in the United States. Uh, and one of the reasons why we're only ranked 30th, despite the fact that our faculty is ranked seventh in quality and impact, is because of what I call the Princeton Law School effect. So the Princeton Law School effect is that if you were to ask people to rank the best law schools in the country, and you had Harvard and Yale and Northwestern and Princeton and UCLA and Stanford on that list, well, the Princeton Law School ranks very highly. And of course, the problem is that Princeton doesn't have a law school. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a halo effect of more established institutions. And so, you know, once the word gets out, we think that we'll be able, you know, the truth in the long run, you have to have an article of faith in higher ed, the truth in the long run should work out, or at least it needs a fighting chance to work out. The Palmer Rock School of Business's full-time MBA program is ranked in the top 25. In the, in the most recent rankings. By the way, tomorrow we're holding a grand opening of the school's new building, an 80,000 square foot state-of-the-art uh, building with classrooms, breakout areas, meeting spaces. So if you haven't stopped by recently, you should stop by the Mirage School, uh, especially if you have an interest in ways in which they can partner to help build your business, to help make a contribution to the regional development of business, whether through executive education, the latest research, uh, or allowing you to hire the latest MBA that they are graduating. It's an outstanding group. Um, we have a summer Shakespeare festival called the New Swan Theater. I don't know if you've had a chance to go, but it's really quite extraordinary. It is an outdoor theater constructed especially in the round. It has received national recognition. Uh, there's a couple of heads, at least one head that is shaking. It's truly an extraordinary... Oh, perfect. Right. So if you haven't had a chance to go, they're doing Hamlet and, uh, excuse me, Macbeth and Much Ado About Nothing this summer. So put it on the list of must-see cultural events in Orange County. We want to make as much of a contribution to the cultural infrastructure of this region and that glory as we do to anything else that we've been talking about. So put that on your list, the New Swan Theater Summer Festival. Uh, you may have heard that uh, we had an interesting speaker at our commencement last year. Uh, the President of the United States came in. Uh, I, uh, the President of the United States. That's right. I, I didn't say which President of the United States. So, you know, we, uh, every 50 years we thought we should have the President of the United States at UC Irvine, right? So Lyndon Johnson was there 50 years ago at the groundbreaking of the campus. Uh, 50 years later, President Obama showed up. Among other things, he noted uh, uh, the leadership of the university on issues of carbon reduction and addressing climate change more generally. You know, we have more green buildings than any other campus in the United States of America. Um, in fact, right now we consume 25% less energy than we did in 2008, even though the campus is much bigger. And we've been recognized by the Sierra Club as the number one university in the country on issues relating to sustainability. So, bragging rights, they call it the coolest campus on green issues. And if you like sports, well, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be an Anteater fan. Our men's basketball team went to the NCAA National Championship Tournament for the first time in our history. Not going to hats off to them, right? Fantastic people have been waiting. I think everybody should give a round of applause. That's our local basketball team. They went to the NCAA first. I'm not saying it was because I was appointed chancellor they were waiting for that to happen. <laughs> But uh, since I'm going to get blamed for a lot of things that are not my fault, I should start taking some credit for things that are also not for me to take credit for. And while the team didn't win the tournament, Peter the Anteater was declared the best mascot of all the mascots in the NCAA tournament. So Peter, very good. What else? Baseball team, which made such an exciting run in the College World Series last year, is nationally ranked and poised to try to repeat. So go Anteater Baseball. Men's soccer made it to the national championship round of 16. Men's golf just won the Big West Championship for the first time in five years. Go golf. Men's volleyball. There you go. Flirting with that number one ranking all season. And now playing for the national championship tournament. Keep an eye out tonight and Saturday for 
what we know is going to be another national championship. This is a dynasty, a new dynasty forged really in the last few years. No better place in the country for men's volleyball. And women's water polo last week earned a spot in the NCAA championship tournament. We'll play Cal on Friday, so go Eaters. What's very interesting, and i very grateful that we have this fabulous sports uh, activity on the campus with tremendous success without all of the craziness that you get at these very, very big places where the stakes are just so high. It feels to me like that's the right level. You know, you know we don't have coaches making $60 billion a year. We got great student athletes performing at a very high level. And so we encourage you to come on out to the Brent Center and other places to watch these incredibly talented, inspirational uh, students perform. Uh, let me end just uh, by saying one quick thing about uh, commercialization and tech transfer, which might be a matter of special interest, and then we can do some question and answer. Um, one of the reasons why the university was put here when all you saw was the rolling hills of the Irvine Ranch was that it was believed that if you created a great research university in a region, that you could then begin to imagine a lively region. I mean, we existed before the city of Irvine existed. The assumption was that there was something specially catalytic uh, about high-end research universities for the development of a place. And so over the years, we've tried very hard to be truthful to that mission. And we've done many good things with the research park right next to the campus. Uh, and, you know, I think very good synergies with medical devices, with communication technology. We have a great photonics laser group. Certainly pockets of the campus where working with local businesses and creating new businesses, that has always been part of what we've done. But when I came in two years ago as provost, I thought that we could operate at an even higher level and try to accomplish that part of the mission in an even more serious and systematic way. So we created last year what we call our Institute for Innovation. And our ambition is to position this institute and the university as a regional catalyst for the development of an innovation economy. Drawing first on exploring the great and tremendous innovation that occurs on the campus among our faculty and students, and seeing which of those discoveries can become uh, businesses and industries of their own. Uh, but more generally, as we build this infrastructure in a way that's helpful for our innovators, um, our world-class innovators, uh, that infrastructure can also serve innovators of Orange County more generally. And so we are thinking about developing this institute not just for the campus on behalf of the campus, but for the region in support of our neighbors and friends. And our fantastic executive director, Richard Sudek, is busy developing VC funds, forging partnerships, including uh, Tech Coast Angels and Golden Seeds, creating industry advisory boards, and building out a 30,000 square foot space at the University Research Park that we are calling the Cove, which will co-locate inventors, entrepreneurs, accelerators, and incubators. And we're seeking out the best partnerships and the best advice to allow us to make the strongest possible con uh, contribution to the region. Our sense is that there are good activities happening in pockets of the region, but no, I think no individual chamber of commerce, no individual city is in a position to make as strong a contribution to the region as the dedicated, focused effort of a $2.5 billion research university if we start developing the right partnerships. And so, I hope that you will, if this is of interest, learn more about us and um, help us with your advice and help us serve the people with that shared mission. Um, and so overall, you know, internally the goal of the university is to accelerate our ascendancy among the world's preeminent research universities. We've had an amazing first 50 years. We are as accomplished as any university could be in its first 50 years. But what's great about UCI is that we know what achieving at the highest level looks like, but we're still young. And so that means that we have a tremendous ambition to continue to mature. 
And as we mature, we want to be a global leader, and we want to be a global leader because we think that's going to do right by Orange County. And the more preeminent we are, the more our work matters in the world, the more we will attract the right talent, create the right kinds of partnerships for our neighbors. And so thanks for the opportunity to give you a little bit of uh, a heads up on what's going on lately at the university. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions that you might have. So thanks a lot. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, quick question. Do you happen to have any numbers on um, the amount of applications you get for transfer students in coming with AAs or transferring in as juniors and the percentage of acceptance of those applications? So I'm looking at Kate about the most recent numbers we have on the on the transfers because the 89,000 number takes into account both freshman applications and transfer applications. It's tens of thousands. It is. I don't have the number, but I will give you my card. And, 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 and what's, but what's important about the question that it gives me a chance, even if I don't know the exact number, to talk about is that the partnership with our community colleges to ease the pathway for transfer students is one of the highest priorities, not just for UCI, but for the University of California in general. I think that we'll be announcing as a system a, a, um, the results of a very focused effort over the last few months to identify the top 10 majors that most transfer students are interested in and to smooth out and create very straightforward pathways for precisely what you need to do in the community colleges in order to make sure that you can slide right in to the University of California. One of the problems that we've had historically is that each of the campuses sometimes have had slightly different requirements. So if you know, the chemistry department at UCLA and the chemistry department at UCI might have wanted this slightly different thing if you were at a community college as a pathway in. And so that is just crazy making. And it's too complicated for students. And we know that if we're really going to be a place that ramps up students so that they can achieve at the highest level, we can't just assume that we're only here for the four-year residential freshman. That the whole point of the California Master Plan is to give people different points of entry initially into higher ed in California and for some of those folks, they achieve at a high enough level that the point is to leverage them up um, the system. And so we, we work on a regular basis with our local community college partners. Uh, we've uh, scheduled lunches on a regular basis. Another one's going to be organized. I'm looking at Kate because she helps me, helps me schedule that. Sometime in July, maybe, July, August, uh, where we all sit down, make sure we're on the same page. And one last example that we should all be proud of, by the way, is that because of the leadership of UCI, um, not too long ago, a thing called the Solar Decathlon came to Orange County, right? So this is an international competition of building houses that are the most energy efficient. And it used to be done on the mall in Washington, D.C. And we, working with the Great Park and uh, other leaders in uh, the city of Irvine, convinced the Solar Decathlon that it should come to the place in the world that should be branded as the most innovative when it comes to this kind of technology and a commitment to these kinds of issues. So we did it in Orange County and uh, this year, next time we have the competition, we are building a team. But we decided that we didn't want that just to be the anteaters. Uh, and so we partnered with our uh, two local community colleges and with Chapman to create a team that we are calling um, uh, uh, Team OC. And so you have every incentive to learn about what these amazing kids from UCI and from Chapman, from Saddleback, from Irvine Valley College are doing. They are here to represent this region and our commitment to the future economy. And I'll tell you, they need a little bit of help, right? Not a lot. $5,000 here, $5,000 there will allow them to compete with the very greatest universities in the world to show how committed we are to the future of a sustainable planet. And so let me suggest that as you're thinking about people to support that, uh, that be on your list because it is Team Orange County, not just Team UCI. And um, it's one demonstration of the kind of partnerships we're trying to forge. So thanks for asking about that. Yes, sir. What about cost of education? I mean, a student can come out with $100,000 in student loans and potentially get a job making $40,000 a year, increasing at 6% a year. You know, what, what do you think as far as the future with cost of education? 
in your, in your, your eyes. And so, uh, when you are trying to challenge American higher education to do the right thing by that, what you would want to see are institutions that were set up so that people, regardless of their background, had meaningful opportunities to come in and not be burdened with debt. And so if you were to look around the country and challenge every institution to meet any goal that you could envision that was an aspirational goal, no other institution would do as well as the University of California has done on that metric. So as I mentioned, you know, we have 40% of our students are Pell eligible students. And so what that means is that uh, we are not a barrier to low-income families the way that most universities are a barrier to low-income families. Students who graduate from UCI, most of them graduate with zero debt. Most of our students actually pay zero tuition uh, because the University of California has a very generous return to aid policy. And if you're making $75,000, $80,000 a year or less, you pay zero tuition. Now, middle-class families are still in more of a bind, and so there is some uh, challenge there. But when those, those families that do have to take on some debt to get through, our debt is $13,000 less on average than you see the average in the United States. So most of our students who take on debt, most take on no debt. Those who take on debt take on an accumulation of about $19,000. And so on average. Now $19,000 is not as good as zero debt. But one of the things I'd say is that if you're 21, 22, and you end up with $19,000 of debt, that's approximately the debt that you would take on if you were buying your first car. And one thing I know is that the University of California's education is going to last a lot longer than their first car. And so we, we are attempting to keep tuition as low as possible. We have the main driver of tuition increases within the University of California is the fact that the state has had an incredibly dramatic disinvestment from the system. Maybe that's fine, maybe that's not fine, maybe we're where we should be. Some people look at the good old days when tuition was, you know, 86 bucks a quarter. We're not going to return to those days. But we have to be honest, I mean, since 2008, the state has cut the budget of the University of California by half a billion dollars. And during that period of time, we're actually educating about seven or 8,000 more California residents without the money. The way in which we educate the California residents without state support, and I know this is going to seem paradoxical, but I, I know you're smart enough to follow the logic here, is if we increase the number of out-of-state students who are paying at a much higher level, they can then subsidize the California residents. This notion that when you've seen an increasing numbers of non-California residents come in, that that's harmful to students in California, it's the opposite that's true. And as one demonstration of that, when the Cal State system lost its funding from the state at around the same time, they shut the doors on 23,000 California residents. So they just said, if you're not paying for the California residents, we're not going to educate them. So whereas the Cal States turned away 22,000 students, we increased the number of California residents that we educated, even with a half a billion dollars less money. But the way that we were doing it is that we had a lever that we could pull that the Cal States couldn't pull, which was the out-of-state tuition lever. Uh, and to put it in perspective, you know, we're, we're at about $13,000 a year for students who do the full freight, and not everybody does that. Uh, we have out-of-state students who are willing to pay $35,000 a year for that education. And we think our education is as good as you're going to see in the private. So at, you know, at USC, it's going to be over $50,000. So $13,000 a year isn't like it was when I was a freshman at UCLA. But it's also not 50. And there are also a lot of people willing to pay $35,000 for the quality of education we have. So it's an issue in American higher ed. But the University of California, I think, is dealing with that issue as well as you can expect, given the state investment. And our hope is that with what looks right now like about a $7 billion state surplus, we're asking for $100 million, the couch cushion money, uh, of the $7 billion extra money that the state didn't realize it had. We're looking for $100 million of the $7 billion uh, to prevent us from raising tuition and to educate 5,000 more California residents. So we'll see whether the state thinks that's a good investment. What I'll say to people in Orange County is, for every dollar that the state 
gives us, we bring in seven additional dollars into Orange County for the reasons that I talked about. So in the abstract, if you're in a part of the state that doesn't have University of California campus, you can think in a pretty abstract way about the general benefit or not of the University of California. But boy, oh boy, the leverage that we provide for Orange County for a little bit of state investment, and the state's uh, part of my budget is 8% of my whole budget is state support. What we do with that relatively small portion for Orange County, I think, should mean that, I hope that it means that you, you could be an advocate for a teeny bit more state support so that it can have leveraging effects in our region. Yeah. yeah, I got a question. Uh, do do foreign, foreign students have any rights, like though, when they took down the flag about a month ago? Well, so there was no taking down of the flag. Uh, flag flew proudly every. Uh, hour. Uh, it's, it in fact flies right outside my office, so I could look out. You know, we heard people say, how come you took down the flag? And, I, and I'm sort of looking outside the window of my office and uh, the flag is still flying. Uh, we, we had a small group of students, six students, who were arguing about a small lobby space in an internal office of the student government and about how to decorate that office space. And so they came in and they initially said, you know, we don't want a flag in our little office space. That was immediately overturned by the student government. Before I had a chance to talk about it, the student government said, that's crazy, and overturned it themselves. So there was never a ban, and I think I might have the only student government in the University of California that would have overturned that ban. So you should be very proud of UCI's students. The students did the right thing. Flag flies very proudly. Our ROTC is fantastic. We do great work for our students who are veterans. And um, uh, it is part of the job at a university that every once in a while, there's going to be somebody at a university with tens of thousands of people who are going to say some things that are a little controversial. But if you didn't want that, you, you, know, you probably shouldn't create the university in the first place. And in the long run, we think it's good for society. So. for one more question, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Gilman. A couple of minutes. I have a 9 o'clock appointment on the campus, but so that's my time. So I personally think that that's amazing that you go from an incredible constitutional scholar, author, and amazing administrator as well, we can tell from what you've said about the university. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Remarks regarding upcoming events. Actually, before we do that, you know, we omitted something in the beginning here. We have our uh, host this morning um, with Gourmet Coffee Service, Paul Tolio. He's just going to quickly tell you about their service. Um, they provide all the coffee service. And Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Just want to make sure everybody did get a cup of coffee in the back. And if you haven't, we're going to be around all morning here. And I uh, just want to thank uh, Steve and Pam for the great job they do for the chamber. And uh, if anybody does have an office with 30 or more people, or if you know anybody in an office with 30 or more people, we do office coffee for businesses. So we come in, put the brewer in, do a once a month delivery of coffee, cream, sugar, cups, and all the pantry items. We also have a pretty awesome referral program. If you guys refer somebody to us and we get an appointment with them, you get a $50 Amazon gift card as a reward. If we get the business, we give you another $200 Amazon gift card as a reward. So think of who you know that needs some coffee, put a little money in your pocket, and uh, Gourmet Coffee Service, we're going to spoil you. So thanks again. Thank you, so just quickly, um, as you're getting ready to leave, uh, I'll just mention that for our, uh, this meeting here, some of you have a lot of new faces this morning. We do this once a month on the first Thursday of the month, right here on um, the Friends Room. Next month, we have Lucy Dunn. She's president of Orange County Business uh, Council. She's an excellent speaker, and I'm sure she's going to have a wealth of information about um, the county and what's going on here. In July, um, um, tagging on the um, drought issue, uh, we have a representative coming from Poseidon. They're looking, they're actually opening a new uh, desalinization facility down at Carlsbad, and they have one on the books for uh, Huntington Beach, so they're going to Tell us a little bit more about their program and why they think um, we need desalinated water here in Orange County. And then in August, we're going to go back to UCI and we're bringing in one of the premier uh, constitutional uh, authorities in the country, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. He's dean of the law school, the law school that 
top 20 law school. Yeah. And um, he'll, he'll be our speaker in August. So we have a great lineup um, for the next three months. A couple other programs that we have. May 20th is our next uh, 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 chamber event. It's our business uh, lecture series luncheon. We have it at the Bahia Corinthian Yacht Club. It's on uh, Wednesday um, from like 11.45 to about 1.30. Um, our speaker that day will be Ken Tudhope. He's, uh, and, and actually this is our first um, sort of program that we're partnering with the UCLA uh, Alumni Association. We're going to try and develop a partnership with them. They're going to help us with some speakers. They may even be partnering with us uh, on our economic forecast in October. So we're kind of excited about that. But that's uh, Wednesday, May 20th. On uh, the 21st, we're going to have, oh, this is actually, for any, any of you folks that want to get involved, um, in our program at the chamber here, we have a thing called Leadership Tomorrow. I'm a graduate myself back in, I think, 01. Um, we're going to have our annual guest luncheon, May 21st. It's going to be at the Civic Center Community Meeting Room. We're going to have mayors from one, two, three, three, three cities and one mayor pro tem. Our mayor, Ed Selig, Steve Menzinger from Costa Mesa, Stephen Choi from Ir Irvine, and John Nielsen, who's the mayor pro tem in the city of Tustin. We are speakers at that event, but it's a great program. It's a one-year program. You come once a month for a day. And you learn about how things really happen here in Orange County, about you know how public safety is done, how health services are delivered through UCI and other uh, great hospitals here in the county, about how arts um, you know, are, are uh, delivered services. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful program. If you want to find out more about your community, I suggest that you contact Pam. <coughs> Contact you? Yeah. Contact Pam at the Chamber Office. We'd love to have you as a guest come and hear about the program and, you know, might be something you're interested in. And then finally, on May 28th, we're doing kind of a dual event. Every year we have to have our annual meeting. So we're going to have our annual meeting from 5 to 5.30 on May 28th at Caliber Collision. It's actually in Costa Mesa, and you think that might be kind of a weird place to have an annual meeting, but they have a great facility there. And the last time we were there, they had this unbelievable food spread for us. And then right uh, segueing from our annual meeting will be our um, mixer. So from 5.30 to 7.30, we'll have our mixer. And uh, it's a great event. I'd uh, love for you all to come, bring some friends. If you're not a member of the Chamber of Commerce, you should be. Please see us about membership. And all these events are on our website at uh, newportbeach.com. Thank you all for coming. Have a great week.